Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me make it absolutely sure I've got this on. There we go. Welcome back to our study of Pastor Wolf Mueller's Has American Christianity Failed? We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, we left off on page 62, and we've been talking about the three uses of the law. Pop quiz. Can you name them? What's the first use? Curb. Curb. Second use? Mirror. And third? Guide. Right. Curb, mirror, and guide. Now, we've talked about the curb. That is what uh, keeps people from doing manifest evil. The, cu the curb is also based on self-interest because there's always, you know, if when children come out of the womb, they're essentially lawless. You know, a little baby, they don't really care though. They'll, they'll hit you, they'll bite you, they'll grab what the, it's nothing personal. It's just the way they are. And God made them very cute, so we put up with this, of course. But, um, but it's, just, it's just the way they are. It's just their nature. And so then along comes the curb. It's like, well, why, why would I choose to do that? Why, why would I not climb up the stairs and possibly fall all the way down? Ah, because mom and dad are stopping me. Why are they? And what's the, what's the penalty? I get put in time out. I get scolded. I get picked up and, and taken somewhere where I don't want to be. Okay, so then what's my motivation for not climbing on the stairs? It's still self-interest. It's that this punishment or this, um, you know, this condition wouldn't occur. So the curb simply continues to appeal to self-interest and therefore it does nothing to change the heart. It can only change the external behavior. Make sense? Okay. Now, once the heart has been changed, once we've been baptized, enlightened, converted, regenerated, the Holy Spirit's within us doing His work, now all of a sudden we have a different attitude, a selfless attitude. We start looking at the world and saying, what, what could I do to give thanks and praise to God, to love Him, and to serve my neighbor as, as my God has served me? In other words, stunned and amazed at all that God has done for me in Christ Jesus. And that Christ would so love me, he would take on my form, the form of a servant, and bear my sins, though he was innocent, and suffer the death I deserve, entirely condemned as if a criminal and the worst of all sinners. That he would do all this for me and for my redemption, that I might have forgiveness, full and free. And not only me, but the whole world. That, that heart of God revealed in Christ Jesus changes our hearts. And suddenly we have a new attitude toward the law. How can I love God? How can I love my neighbor as God has loved me? And that's then when we turn to the law as a guide. We say, this is, this is the will of my good and gracious Father. And sad to say, I, I of course don't conform to it, but I desire to. I desire to. I delight in the law, in my inner being, Paul writes. Okay, now that part that I hinted at just a moment ago, that, that part of the law that is always unattainable, that always ends up showing us who God is and who we're not, and shows us our sins, that's then the, the second part, or sometimes called the chief use, or the theological use of the law. The law as a mirror. Right. How's that work? You know, I can wake up first thing in the morning and just assume I'm my usual radiant, handsome self, go about my business, never mind that my kids are mocking me for my hair going like this, you know, maybe some drool in the corner of my mouth. I can just set that aside because I know better than them. I know I'm glorious and attractive just all the time, all day, every day, until I go into the restroom and look in the mirror. Right. Then I see what I could not previously see, and I am disillusioned. <laughs> disillusioned. I'm a mess. 
And that's precisely what God's law does for us. It serves as a mirror. Every human being by nature thinks they're great and glorious and a good person and, you know, I'm, or at least above average. And if anyone, um, if, you know, if anyone's going to get into heaven, it's a pretty sure bet I'm going to get into heaven. As one politician said, <laughs> said years ago, and I, this still sticks in my mind, he said, if anyone has earned their way into heaven, it would be me. Yeah, that's, uh, that's at least a dead honest expression of the sinful nature within us. So along comes God's law and says, you think you're good? Here's the standard. Here's the definition of good. Right. This is why people hate and despise the law, hate and despise morality that comes to us from God, because they recognize that they're not it, and that nothing within them is going to solve this or change this. So that's the mirror use of the law. It shows us the reality of who we are and how woefully short we fall of the glory of God. Now that theological use, um, in fact, all three of these uses continue in our lives as Christians because where the law is, all three of these functions or all three of these uses are, and we can see and feel them working upon us. We can, we can see in the scriptures where authors are intending, you know, St. Paul intending to use the law to guide us. Okay? We can see other times where St. Paul uses the law to condemn us and r reveal to us our sins. We can start to sense this in the preaching that comes from the pulpit. Um, oh, this is, this is the pastor condemning. This is the pastor guiding. Okay? And these are, um, these are then uses of the law. So far, so good? Okay. Now, in the context of Wolf Mueller's teaching, we're doing some heavy lifting here. It's not exactly fun stuff. But there are two things of which fallen man must uh, come to terms with. And the first of those is the law. The first of those is that we're not, in fact, good. We are, in fact, way worse than we thought. We are, to use the language of Paul in Ephesians 2, dead in our trespasses. Okay, that's the first. Now, the second is going to come along and say, but God in his grace has sent his son Jesus to save you by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from all works or doing, simply because that is who God is. God is love. God is gracious. Those are the two things, right? It's often been remarked that in our modern world where, you know, Whatever pain it is you're feeling, you can pretty much go take a pill and at least be in a better way within 15 or 20 minutes. Um, where, you've got, where you've got that kind of pain relief going on. Um, and I think you can see this in our society, this, that kind of pain relief and the kind of pleasures we have at our disposal. You know, you can, you can just push a couple buttons on your phone and before you know it somebody's at your door giving you goodies uh, in this kind of world what is what is the most challenging to grasp the law or the gospel what would you say that God is that God is a harsh and condemning judge precisely because he's just or that God is merciful and lackadaisical and easygoing it's much harder to grasp the law, that, that there is justice, that God does care, that he is watching, that there is going to be a reckoning. That is almost impossible in our culture to believe. Now imagine, I think it's easiest for us because of some of our incorrect historical biases, but imagine the Dark Ages, which frankly weren't all that dark relative to where we are now. But imagine the Dark Ages and the peasants, and there's, there's no Tylenol in the cabinet, and there's no, um, there, there's no uh, dentists, there's no anesth anesthetic at the doctors, okay? And everything is pain, and everything is dirt, and everything is infection, and everything is going to kill you, okay? Now what is, what is harder to believe? That God is harsh precisely because he's just or, it, or that God is like lackadaisical and everybody have a good time. So you can see it's very easy to believe. All right, so when you're in the medieval period, what is it? it it's very easy to believe that God is a just, uh, that God is a just judge, that he is harsh on sin, that he condemns sin and afflicts man. Uh, that is a piece of cake. That is self-evident. What is hard to believe when a preacher comes along and says, but God is gracious in Jesus. 
He's like, whoa, you're going to have to prove to me that. Okay, you're going to have to prove to me that. But it's good for us to see how this is inverted and flipped in our culture to where everybody thinks God's the good guy in the sky. He's just got the stock market on autopilot and, you know, money's flowing and we've got, we, we can take away our pain. We can get instant gratification anytime we want. God doesn't care. He's not going to judge. So you can see the spirit of our age and you can see the uphill battle then we fight as Christians in this context. It's not so much rushing in and telling everyone that God's gracious. They're like, yeah, if there is a God, he's real gracious, no doubt. Um, but first, to assert the fact of the law that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And so that becomes our chief task now. That's why the scandal um, of preaching Jesus is that first component of preaching Jesus, which is the very reason that we need a savior, the law as mirror. That's the most difficult part today. Okay, so we're talking about the three uses, the, the curb, the mirror, and the guide. Let's simply pick up on 62, and we'll do the last full paragraph, which talks about the mirror. We'll let Wolf Mueller carry us along here for a bit. Yes. Oh, yes, please. Mm. You're forbidden to talk. One yeah. second. <laughs> Just teasing. Just one second. There we go. I know, one of these days. <laughs> I was just thinking, what was the one thing that they all, in the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, they all worked together to build these beautiful cathedrals. Mm -hmm. They turned to God. Mm -hmm. And now we turn away from God. Oh. And you have everything you need. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. There, boy, there, we could do some deep dive analysis <laughs> and pondering on that, couldn't we? Yeah. Why don't... Um, why aren't churches made today like they were made back then? Not yeah. Slave labor, that's part of it. Cheap labor, maybe so. So that's a fair point. Well, like I said, there's a lot we could analyze along those lines, pro and con. Pro and con. But what are, um, I mean, the, the great artists of our day, are there any? I don't know. If there are, um, what are they doing? It's not... It's not reflective of, of God and Christ. At least here in the West, there's been a major change in the West. Well, let's not, let's not go too far down that path. It's very fascinating, but no, it's a great point. It's very fascinating, very fascinating. Okay, so uh, page 62, last full paragraph, looking at the law as a mirror. The second use of the law is the mirror. The law shows us our sin, it accuses us. This is the theological use of the law. And it is the chief and most important function of the law. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put an asterisk there and say it is the chief and most important function of the law right now in a fallen world. Okay. That's the point that's being made. If you, if you take this as some sort of universal axiom, um, then you've got a problem. Because then if the law isn't accusing, then the law has no place. The law is to be destroyed, annihilated, taken away entirely. See, and that's just not the case. It's just not the case. Um, in the world that God created with Adam and Eve in it, do you think that world was a world of uh, where blaspheming God was acceptable? Or where dishonoring God and his word was acceptable? Uh, where murdering one another is acceptable, where adultery is acceptable and rampant fornication, where theft is it? No, no of course not. So how was, how was Eden created with the law embedded in the hearts and minds of Adam and Eve? Okay? When, you, when you die, when you die and you go up to heaven, do you expect there to be a police force in heaven? Keeping, keeping people from, in heaven from uh, committing heinous crimes. No. Why? The law is written and embedded into the hearts of those souls as they await the resurrection of their body. In the new heavens and the new earth, do you think there's going to be a government or a police force or um, people sinning and needing to go to the pastor for a confession and absolution? Of course not. The law is embedded in our hearts and in our bodies holistically and finally. Okay, so if we zoom all the way out, it's important for us to realize that the good and gracious will of God, the natural law, the morality of the law, has been written into creation, 
past, present, and future. But here on this earth, in this life, we are by nature sinful and unclean. What is the primary function of the law for us? And that is what the point is here, that the primary function is that it is a mirror that reveals to us our need for a savior, for Jesus. Okay, so far so good. We want to do the whole context there, lest we try to turn this into some sort of axiom and get everything wrong. Um, the law is innate in God's creatures right up until the fall. The law is good and glorious. Adam and Eve delighted in the, the content of the law. The saints in heaven delight in the content of the law. In the new heavens and the new earth, we will delight in the content of the law. It's only right now that we don't because the content of the law reveals to us our sin and shows to us how deeply uh, sinful and unclean we are. All right, so again, this is the theological use of the law, and it is the chief and most important function of the law. As a mirror, the law condemns us. The law teaches us something that we can't know by our feelings and experiences. That's key. That's a wonderful point. Okay, the law is telling us something we can't know by our feelings and experiences. Namely, that sin has corrupted us to the core. So there is a certain unbelievability about what the Bible says in regard to our sin. Because it's contrary to our own feelings and reason and experience. I, I'm not that bad. Not every thought I have is terrible. I'm not a monster, you know, this kind of thing. And then the scriptures come along and say, well and good, but there is still no righteousness within you. Even the righteous deeds within you are as filthy rags in the sight of God. It's all, it's all bad fruit from a bad tree. Okay? So that's the law. The law tells us something that is impossible for us to, by nature, accept. So for the law to even do its work upon us is the operation of the Holy Spirit, such that we would agree with the law that it is good and we are not. It, is, it has the right diagnosis of us my own reason, feelings, my own sense of myself is in error. Okay. So this is the, um, the joyous humiliation of the law. It shows us what we are over and against what we think we are. So it's a, it's a miraculous and supernatural thing that the law does. So once more, the law teaches us something that we can't know by our feelings and experiences, namely that sin has corrupted us to the core. The law teaches us that all of the wrong things we do, say, and think are symptoms of an even deeper problem. I am a poor, miserable sinner. Any honest person would confess that he makes mistakes. I'm not perfect. I might even confess that those mistakes are sins. But if we are to know that our nature is corrupt and our heart is wicked, then God's law must teach this to us. The law is a mirror, not only, uh, excuse me, the law as a mirror, not only shows me my sin, but it also shows me what that sin deserves, God's wrath. The mirror of the law shows me that I deserve to be condemned to hell. The prophet Jeremiah called the law of God a hammer that smashes us to pieces. Jeremiah 23, 29. The law smashes us when it shows us how repulsive and offensive we are to the holiness of God. The cross and suffering of Jesus are the most severe preaching of the law. Okay, that's an interesting point and a point he's going to expand upon. Um, but I'll simply highlight the foreshadowing that takes place here. The cross and suffering of Jesus are the most severe preaching of the law. His pain and shame and darkness should be ours. We should be the ones forsaken and smitten by God. And then he says, you can see Psalm 22.1 or Isaiah 53.4. Um, he continues, when the law is doing 
this mirror work of showing us our sin and accusing us, we are tempted to think that the law is the problem, that the law is bad. No, the law is supremely good. The problem is our sin. All right, very, very key point, because this is one of the places where Lutherans, as, as of the latter half of the 20th century, went completely off the rails. Went completely off the rails. We mistook the law for being bad. And the law is something that needs to be removed. And you still got this nonsense theology. Wherever you find this, it's just understand that it's completely aberrant. It's not faithful to Lutheranism. It's not faithful to the scriptures. It's a complete novelty, and it wreaks havoc on everything. Because if the law is to be removed, then what of Adam and Eve? Then what of the saints in heaven? Then what of the new heavens and the new earth? They're all fornicating. They're all thieving. They're all covetous. No, of course not. Well, then the law is in place? Yeah, of course it's in place. So you have to understand um, where, this, where this hatred of the law comes from. Um, and it comes, frankly, from a misunderstanding of Luther, really a misunderstanding in the minds of the people who believe this, that they read back into Luther and then try to read back into the scriptures. So we want to, we want to take into our hearts and minds this point that Wolf Mueller makes. It's very important. The law is not the problem. The law is not bad. The law is good. I am the problem. My sin is the problem. All right. And Romans 7, interestingly enough, is one of the great proof texts for this. Okay, let's pause there and see if you have any thoughts, because otherwise I'm going to push us forward just a little bit into the text. But any thoughts on the curb, the mirror, or the guide? I see a couple of hands. I have a question about how we should think rightly about when we're in heaven, our perfected, nature with regard to the law will be unable to sin we won't be tempted to sin correct correct and then but adam and eve were tempted so there won't be any temptation it's over it's finished it's corrected and for all time yes um Correct. So maybe a cleaner way to think about this, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the way you posed it, but maybe a cleaner way of thinking about this is Adam and Eve in the garden are created good, but not yet perfect, not yet complete. Okay. So the fact that they're created good and that there's this possibility of falling are two things that don't translate into the new heavens and the new earth. And the new heavens and the new earth, when we're resurrected in our bodies, um, we will be far more glorious than Adam and Eve. We will be far more glorious than our hypothetical selves had Adam and Eve not fallen and we had been born naturally into this world. Right? Um, but what is certain is we will be perfect and we will not have opportunity to be tempted um, of course, within our own nature, just as within Christ's nature. Uh, he was tempted. Did he sin? No. Did he even come close? No. And that would be how it is for us, conformed into his image. Um, so even in the hypothetical, I don't believe there's any temptation, but even in the hypothetical event of God said, okay, let's try this again. Here's the tree. Nobody, nobody eat from it, okay? I mean, what are we going to do? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. We know where that leads, and there's going to be no possible way for us to be tempted. Now, all of, the, all of this is really easily solved by the proof text where Jesus promises us eternal life. He couldn't promise that if there's any possibility of us wrecking it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that one word eternal is the words of Christ that anchor us in the knowledge that we will be confirmed, and it'll be impossible for us to fall. Yeah. Please. Pastor, f to follow up on that question, uh, could it be said that there's a difference between good and holy? And even the angels uh, fell from heaven. So they may not have been created holy. Uh, Adam and Eve weren't holy. Um, but there's got to be some, uh, on the spectrum, difference between good and holy. Mm, 
Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Is that a, something we could talk about? Yeah, well, maybe so. So with holiness, you have to just be really careful in how you're defining terms yeah. with holiness. And that's kind of the first key. And then you can compare that to like the language of good. And even that, you kind of want to define your terms in this case. One, you know, one thing I would say, though, the, the scriptures are overall quite silent on the nature of the angels and on the nature of their moral fall. We have, we have very minor indication um, applying to the, the pride and the conceit of Satan himself. But you'll notice, for example, in, Gen in the Genesis creation narrative, the angels aren't there except they're kind of inferred. Right? Um, we know they're there, but the nature of their creation, are they, are they created um, good, the way Adam and Eve are created, good, yeah, probably, but is there still some, could there be some difference between their nature and ours, between their ability to fall and ours, the contours of that and ours? Uh, the Bible probably, with its silence there, leaves us with more questions than answers. So I hate to anthropomorphize and kind of take what's true for us and revealed to us about human nature and the human fall and simply just impose that on the angels. I don't, I don't know. You know, I, the Bible doesn't give us enough information there. In some respects, there are, there are some key things that are not parallel. For example, most theologians will say that, that the good angels and the bad angels are already in a state of confirmation. Right? That is to say that the bad ones are forever bad and there's not ever going to be changed. The good ones are forever good and they're incapable of being changed. I mean, that right there is enough to sort of give us this dynamic of, okay, well, what's going on with them doesn't parallel what's going on with, with us. Yeah, yeah. Jesus didn't die for the angels. Jesus did not die for the angels. He's, he's nonetheless king of the angels, as Hebrews says, and as our Christmas hymn has us sing. Um, but no, he did not die for the angels. We, at least we have no indication of that in the scriptures. He did not give Satan or the fallen angels a chance at redemption. At least we have no indication of that in the scriptures. Um, nowhere in the scriptures does our Lord teach us to pray for the redemption of Satan and the fallen angels. Uh, frankly, quite o opposite, um, that we would pray for their, for their doom, um, for the end of the evil one. So, very different, very different, yeah. Please. I have a, a question regarding, uh, you know, we live in a world, you know, fallen world, corrupt world, and uh, we, uh, some of us fall into the habit of listening to media, uh, cable news, uh, streaming uh, reality shows and crime shows on, you know, eight, ten hours a day. We, we, we overindulge and expose ourselves to these truths. Uh, that are cultural truths and they're against God's word. My question, I guess, is if, if God's law is there as the standard um, and this is different than that, how sh should we be exposing ourselves to that and, and to what degree and does it harm our nature and soul? Yeah, the, I mean, the scriptures don't set any limits per se. There is St. Paul's admonition, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is holy, etc., think on these things. And I think it tough, it'd be tough to make the case that the cable news channels are that. <laughs> so, so that in itself would kind of infer that we take that in very small doses, moderation. But what is moderation? You know, We're to be in the world, not of it. I, it would be foolish for us, on the other hand, to say, well, um, I'm not of the world, therefore I'm not going to be in it. I'm going to bury my head in the sand, uh, buy some land up in Canada, and just get off the grid entirely because I can't, you know, I can't be tainted by the world. That's not what God desires for us. He desires that we be in the world, not of it. So we need to have exposure to the things that are going on in the world, but we need to moderate that in the same way we moderate food and drink, in the same way we moderate, in our culture, exercise, health of the body. We want to be attuned to the health of our soul. 
And I think that that's a paradigm that's been lost, so I'm very thankful that you brought that up because it's just not something we consider. Is this healthy for my soul? Is this healthy for my spirit? We have, in our culture, we have paradigms for the mind. Is this psychologically healthy? Or is this um, physically healthy? And in our society, we're very, very preoccupied with the physical, secondarily with the mind. Where's the spiritual? Almost gone. Nobody thinks in these terms. And um, of course, the spiritual should be the most important. We, have our, we are our souls. <laughs> you know, the mind is subject to change with brain chemistry. The body is subject to change, obviously. Um, we, need to pay, we need to pay attention to what we are, which is souls, and the immortality of, of that, and then um, treat that with the highest reverence and honor. So all things in moderation, but particularly just, I mean, what is, does the news make money from advertising by selling, by selling good news? Are people really, really interested in tuning in to the fact that the auto cavo crop, uh, avocado crop is really good this year? No, nobody's going to watch that. But when you've got two talking heads yelling at each other, it's like, ooh, there's a fight. Who's going to win? I know whose side I'm on. Well, this is what I would have said, right? And riling up all this uh, negative stuff within our souls. And, um, it appeals to our souls, doesn't it? Good news doesn't really appeal to us. It's boring. We want a little so that, you know, it's like vegetables. We want just a little on the side so we can feel good about ourselves, good about the world. But then get me back to the, to the Doritos and Cheetos of uh, political fighting and drama and violence and all of that stuff. Yeah, it's, um, so I think your, your point's well taken, Barry. We really want to be moderate with our intake of that. Yeah. I really do think, while, while we're waiting here, I, I really do think it's one of the great diseases of our modern age that it's like, you've got a lot of people who are really depressed, really despairing, hate the world, you just hate everything. And it's like, well, how do you spend your day? Watching news? Okay. I'm, I'm sensing a correlation here. Maybe not a causation, but I'll leave that to you. But at least a correlation. Wonder if you got rid of the one, if the other might not might not improve. Please. So to look at to the bigger picture, God created us w with knowing that, well, he's created us for us to get tempted and we will fall into these temptations. But the only thing that he's telling us to be is to believe in him and his word and hang in there until he takes us to heaven. And in the meantime, we should just meditate day and night into his word and deal with, deal with it. Mm. As long as we believe in his word and his grace is going to be upon us. Mm. I, think, I think that that's, um, that's kind of true. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> kind of true. Um, so so here's, here's the way I would... I would phrase it or frame it, that um, that uh, Augustine makes the point, and the Lutherans take this up in, in our confessions, and so this is, a, this is a standard for us and very helpful for considering these, these questions of like, what was God doing before he created the world? Creating hell for people who ask such questions. <laughs> no, that's the joke. But but um, here's the distinction from Augustine: that foreknowledge does not equal causation. Foreknowledge does not equal causation. In other words, God, before He made anything, could foresee that we would in fact fall. But that doesn't mean He caused it. It doesn't mean that He desired that we fall. I, sometimes Lutherans, again, I, as of the 20th century, have gotten really twisted on this point because they're so scared of saying that the atonement was plan B um, that they just don't like that. And so they, like, they cause, they rob from one hand to pay the other and you end up with this sort of Manichaean God who creates good and evil, who causes the fall. That's terrible theology. So God desires man not to fall creates man capable of not falling, orchestrates the world as a reflection of who he is and his grace and his goodness. Um, he, 
He can foresee that we will fall. He can foresee the answer is Christ, and thus we can say with the scriptures that Christ is crucified before the foundation of the world. It's just not that he caused it. He's going to work his good purposes through the evil uh, that, that is afflicted upon us by Satan and then by our own uh, will bound to Satan's will. Okay, what does that mean for everyday life? I think it's a little, I think it's, I think that a great atrophying has occurred if we look at it merely as hanging on, believing the word, surviving until the end. Okay, what would be the merits of that? The merits of that would be the repeating word throughout all of the uh, New Testament scriptures. Endure, 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 endure. I haven't done a word count or looked at this, but I would guess that that word endurance among significant words ranks very high because there is this idea of endure, endure, endure. But if we just simply take that in a vacuum, that can lead us to some false conclusions. That I'm just sitting here enduring while God is pummeling me. And we can get this, we can kind of even get this weird sort of thing of like, like God's acting as if he, you know, this dark night of the soul, this overly egotistical theology we like to work ourselves up into of like, God's trying to get rid of me, but he can't. I'm going to hold on firm to his promises. I'm a super Christian. I'm a super Lutheran kind of thing. Okay, what would be another biblical way to look at this beyond merely enduring? And this, this is all over the scriptures, probably even more than endurance. And that is that God is working a new creation. He is present tense making all things new. And that includes us. Right? He is the potter, we are the clay. What on earth are these tools of his by which he is carving off certain parts of us, forming certain intricacies and beautiful design within us? I mean, what does it look like? Wet and muddy and gross? So that's what this, you know, that's parallel to how that we experience this life. It's nothing appealing. But what's the final product? This beautiful, beautiful vessel fit for the house of the king. Um, and that's what God is doing. What are, what, is this, what are these hands that are forming? What are these chisels and tools that are carving off? This is the affliction, that is wor this momentary affliction that is working for us an eternal weight of glory. So I think beyond merely endurance, which of course has its place, especially in terms of persecution, it's like just endure, just don't apostatize. It's that easy. Okay. But aside from that, a more robust I doctrine is to see the hand of God and see the Lord Jesus making all things new. And that includes us on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a yearly basis, on decade basis. We can even look back at our lives and without any, without any sense of self-righteousness, we know we're poor, miserable sinners, but we can say, I can see how God has changed me. I can see how I once thought that way and could never think that way again. I could see how I once acted that way and I'm terribly ashamed of it and I would never act that way again. Uh, God is shaping us and forming us. He's causing us to, he's causing new movements and new things within our personality so that we're ever more like our Lord Jesus, willing to love God even when he forsakes us, living, uh, willing to love neighbor even when neighbor hates and despises us. Um, we see how woefully short we are, but we, st we see the handiwork of God. And that's the point. So this can, this can change your eyes like lenses. You can start to see the whole world differently. You can see it like God forming the new heavens and the new earth in our midst. You could already start to see the shadows like taking place. Like a shadow is not the right word because it's dark. What is a sh what is the what is the light version of a shadow? <laughs> I don't know. What is what is it when you can begin to see the thing before it's fully there? Like a silhouette of pure light. You can already see the tree of life silhouetted in the crucifix of Jesus. And the, tr and the fruit hanging from that tree, his own sacrifice, the very love of God embodied from which we will eat. And he who is life gives us life. He who is love makes us love. He who is holy shares his holiness with us. You can already see these things beginning to sh take shape in creation. You can see the saints of God shining. Sometimes even if just for a moment, you might even see your spouse shining like a saint or your child or someone at church. Just in some small little thing, it happens to me from time to time. I'm just gobsmacked because I'm like, I'm in the presence of a saint. I can see it. I can see this person radiating with the light of Christ. It's, um, so to start to see the new creation unfolding in our midst, to start to have the lenses of our eyes. You know, St. Paul had those, 
how those lenses fall off his eyes and he could see things as they are. I, I look at that as a, a type and process that our Lord is doing for us. The, the apocalypsis, the unveiling, the revelation of Jesus Christ in front of our eyes, the revelation of the world as it is, the revelation of the new creation, the new heavens and the earth, already breaking through, already penetrating in, in the waters of holy baptism when a child of darkness becomes a child of light and the Holy Spirit enters in and there is a new creature. And then seeing, seeing the transition in people's understanding from this life is where it's at, this life is where I've got to get all my good stuff, this life is where I need to be fulfilled, to realizing that is profoundly, not only is that profoundly unrealistic, that's so short-sighted. That's like, that's like wanting, it's like, a, it's like a great king saying to you, you could have anything in the world that you want, and you say, I want this handful of dust. Do you not understand? I mean, that's the goods of this world. You want a handful of dust? Yeah, I want a handful of dust and I want to hold it for a couple decades. And I want to have to hold it in such a way that people are constantly trying to steal it from me and I've got to protect it and fight for it. And you cannot have my little pile of dust. It's mine for these whole five minutes. That Really? That's what you want? Because that's all this life is. So, so then you see, people's, you see people's mindsets change towards the goods that they have and they start to put it in service of God and service of neighbor. You start to see um, people looking forward to um, aging and looking forward to the pains and looking forward to the affliction. Look, why? How else am I going to be conformed into the image of Christ? How else am I against my will, against my fallen will, going to be conformed? <laughs> the, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm on a bit of a diatribe right here. Yeah. I don't want to be in that. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're giving me a new perspective. Yeah, of course. Of course. It's, um, it's this beautiful thing where you start to see the shape of your own outer man perishing as precisely the shape of your inner man being renewed. You know, God brings us into this world, we have absolutely nothing. He gives us as much as he gives us, and then he starts taking it all away again, so that we're at the same, like, like T.S. Eliot says, so that we're at, the same, we're at the same place all over again, but this time we recognize it. And so as we go into death, we realize our infancy, our entire dependence upon God, but now we recognize it, and we recognize who he is, and we're willing to close our eyes in death, <clears throat> entrusting ourselves to him. I don't know, it changes everything, doesn't it? It changes absolutely everything. It's, it's like, I mean, it's like what dreams and what psychedelic drugs and what visionary experiences and like what all these things only hint at. And that is what God's word does for us in the unveiling, the revelation, the ongoing revelation of Christ Jesus and the new creation being worked in our midst. So, sorry for that lengthy diatribe, but I, I think about this a lot. And um, I deal with people who are suffering a lot. And the, this, is the, this is the good news that Christ has for us. It all has meaning. It all has purpose. Um, we need to get you a microphone. Oh, oh sorry. Okay, so Chris and then yeah, over okay. please. The yeah. one thing I was just saying with the law, I, th I think I'd rather do like the Pharisees and Sadducees and just kind of water it down. Then, you know, I'm pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's what we always want to do with the law is water it down so that somehow we can obey it. Somehow we can just do our best and that'll be enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we need Jesus, right? <laughs> yeah, we should, we should cast that down because we need the law in its full sternness so we have Christ in his full sweetness. And then Christ in his full sweetness, we delight in the law and we see how God's conforming us against the will of our sinful nature. But for the will of the new man, conforming us into uh, the law embodied, love embodied. I have to say I'm doing pretty good with understanding the aging process and the new creation, etc. Good, yeah. But what I remind myself is I can't forget that God has a purpose for me mm -hmm. in helping him in this new creation. You know, what does he have for me to do even when I'm getting more infirm? Um, he's not done yet because we're part of his team, right? Right, right. And so I think, I think that we, um, we want to be careful because there's this American utilitarian and pragmatic idea, like if I can't see an effect, it has no meaning. 
Like if I like if it doesn't like if I can't point to the needle moving one degree, then what I did has no meaning. We've got to shake free of that because it has meaning between you and God. It may have no quote unquote effect, no tangible. Well, this changed. Does it therefore not have value? Of course, it has value. It has value between you and God. I mean, this is this is really the paradigm of true worship. It's where you can do anything and be worshiping God because it's it's a position of the heart, not a position of did the move, needle move or not. I mean, this is the, because we lose sight of this all the time, don't we? I mean, I think about this all the time because the church is in the West here and in the States is in this profound period of decline. Nobody's growing except for churches that are pilfering from other churches and deluding people and kicking them out the back door spiritually damaged. I mean, nobody, it's, so it's this time of great decline. I mean, what, what do we gain from this? Well, one meditation is that if God wants it to grow, he's going to cause it to grow. If God wants the needle to move, he's going to move it. And he doesn't need me to do that. Okay, so then what, what then what then is my focus as a pastor, or what then is my focus in vocation as a Christian? And not so much like, well, did the needle move? And then, did, and then did, thus it has value before God? No. Jesus, I, I mean, the Lord doesn't say, you know, move the needle and I will give you eternal life. He says, be faithful and I will give you eternal life. Be faithful unto death and I will give you eternal life. That relationship component b between us and God doesn't go away. You know, this is one of the most difficult things because people will get in a place of chronic, um, chronic illness or chronic pain or chronic suffering where they're basically shut in and there is no tangible needle moving. About the best you could cling to is like, well, I can bear witness to my caretaker or something like that. I mean, the problem, the problem isn't that we're becoming less human. The problem is that our entire frame of judging what it means to be human is wrong. We don't need to be moving the needle or doing something pragmatic to have extreme value and to have every single day. I mean, you can be a, you can be a quadriplegic laying in bed and suffering in faithfulness, affecting absolutely nothing, and be the joy of God's heart and be the apple of his eye and give the most worthy and profound worship on the face of the earth. But doesn't Jesus teach us this with the, with the widow's might? How much does she move the needle? Of what pragmatic value is her offering? But how does the Lord see it? I mean, the Lord has all the money in the world. He doesn't need our money. The Lord has all the pragmatism at his disposal. He doesn't need our pragmatism. He doesn't need us to move the needle. He can do that whenever he pleases. What does the Lord desire? What does he love? A heart turned toward him. A heart that knows who he is in Christ Jesus and a heart that reflects that back in whatever circumstance it's in. And that's what it is to be conformed in the image of Christ. That's what it is for Christ to be on the crucified, uh, Christ on the cross crucified and be crying out, not, you have forsaken me, but my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God. That's, that's the cry of faith, the cry of love, the cry of the perfect heart. You know, this is the glory of man and man is the glory of God. And so these are the things we want to press on toward. We want to get rid of these poisonous frames that denude our lives of meaning. And we want to embrace these biblical frames of seeing, of seeing our relationship first and foremost with God. And then that can take place in any setting in life. You cannot lose it. You cannot lose it. You can be a paraplegic. You can lose your mind. You can do whatever. But insofar as you have any strength whatsoever, um, it, is, it is to cling to God and endure in the faith and to love the Lord Jesus as he has loved you. And that has profound value and meaning in and of itself. And to anybody, again, who has eyes to see, you see it as, you see it as cruciform. That's the, that's the thing. So your lenses change and you begin to see the world as it truly is. And it's on the deathbed where I really see a saint. I mean, really, really see them shining because this person has nothing to offer to God and they're clinging to God. This person has no needle to move, nothing to advance, no measurable purpose, and they're clinging to God. And they're clinging to God in the midst of suffering. And, and that's it. What is the meaning of my life? Jesus. Jesus. And that's the, that's the truth of John's gospel. It's the answer to Ecclesiastes. Not merely that the Word became flesh, but that the meaning became flesh. That's what the word is, is the meaning. 
And what is that meaning? It's no esoteric or philosophical thing. How stupid is that? How shallow is that? The meaning of my life is to have a white picket fence. The meaning of my life is to retire. I mean, this is the kind of dust in our hand that's just nonsense. The meaning of my life is Jesus, now and for all eternity, the very heart of the Father. And then to, be conf to have the glory of being conformed into his image in whatever way, shape, or form that takes place in this earth. And to know that before the foundation of the world, God foresaw and did in fact cause this, did in fact cause the ways in which we would be conformed into the image of his son. That's a line right out of the formula of Concord. It's so beautiful. But that God, so he knows we're going to fall. Not only does he plan our redemption in Jesus, but he knows each one of us, calls each one of us by name, and he knows exactly the kinds of sufferings we're going to have, exactly the kind of disappointments we're going to experience, exactly the kind of like soul-crushing, life-crushing events and crosses that we are going to carry. He's planned it all. He's set limits and bounds on all of it precisely in order to develop us into unique sons and daughters of God, immortal and everlasting, conformed to the image of Jesus. Could you imagine a greater glory or a greater honor? And now you can see why Paul compares this life to like a fetus to an adult. That's how we are in this life relative to how we shall be. A seed to a, to a cedar of Lebanon, that's the difference between who we are in this life and what we shall be for all eternity. I mean, these are the biblical paradigms. So if you really look at that seed on a molecular level or on some kind of DNA level, you'd be able to see the whole thing. That's about how it is right now. You're just looking at the seed, just looking at the fetus, testing the genetics, saying, I can see what this is and what this is going to be, how this is going to unfold. That's the glory of seeing the work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit um, in our lives even now. So, sorry for this lengthy, lengthy diatribe. Obviously, you got me on a topic I'm very passionate about. So. Okay, so I saw some hands popping up, and I'm sorry, I rudely kept talking. So it sounds like it is necessary for us to fall and to repent on it and grow. Mm. So is it, you know, that God really, it's not he causes us, but it is, sounds like it's really necessary. Mm. So that's a great question. It's a question theologians have wrestled with for at least hundreds of years. There's even a little Latin phrase for this, Felix culpa, blessed fault. There's a lot of theological discussion to be had, and there's a lot of theological problems with asserting that it was necessary, because how do we know it was necessary? God who can accomplish all things, could he not have brought us to these same revelations without a fall? I think he could have. I think it'd be difficult to answer that he could not have. I think um, this is the way that uh, Luther, for example, understood it, and he's not alone, he's with the church fathers on this point, that God, that God designed Adam and Eve not to fall, but he designed Adam and Eve to be good and to grow into perfection, into the fullness of what it is to be a human being. When Adam and Eve fell, God didn't say, well, I guess that didn't work out. Um, I guess off they, off, they go into, off they go into this fallen reality. They'll never achieve what I wanted them to achieve. No, what God does is puts them right back on track, puts us right back on track. But now that track looks different. Instead of the conformity into the image of Christ being a pleasant and blessed thing, it's now a painful thing. But we end up at the same place. So it's not, so then by that, by that frame, it's in no sense necessary that we fall. In fact, we would have found this development into maturation and this development into the fullness of the image of God to be nothing but blessing after blessing after blessing until we finally achieve the fullness of what we wanted. Because we fell, God restores us to that, but now that can only be achieved through great pain and suffering. And so it's not at all necessary then in that sense. Um, it's, it's only secondarily necessary given the other conditions fulfilled. So I think that that's the healthiest way to look for that. God didn't need the fall. Um, we fell. God is now um, turning, turning lemons into lemonade. Um, 
to put it very superficially, but rather taking the evil and using it for good, more profoundly, more biblically, the story of Joseph. What, what you meant for evil, God has worked for good. Yeah. Okay, I see a hand. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, well, you kind of went in the direction I was thinking about too. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the paradigm shift this world faced, and obviously the tree of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Before the fall, we only knew good. The paradigm has shift, which has made it necessary to suffer now, I think, because now we know evil too. And um, the brain looks for differences. How good things are is only in comparison to how bad we've already had it too. We can't, it's appreciating the highs and knowing that the lows are what help us to appreciate the highs. I, and so it was kind of like what you were saying, you know, and, and I think it's just a paradigm shift. You're right, God didn't, we didn't need the fall. He didn't design, pre-design that this is what was gonna happen, but we did it. And now we needed, you know, something, you know, we, the, the paradigm of the world, we now see, no, we know, evil and good. We know it. Yeah, and the knowing there, I mean, there's a great case to be made, and I, I think most, again, most the, of most the best theologians in the church make this case that Adam and Eve had an intellectual knowledge of what evil is. They had an intellectual understanding of what death is. Again, it's this idea, remember how we talked about this last week or the week before, how the modern world has it all backwards. We think we're evolving into more and more, and the truth is we're devolving into less and less. If you don't believe that, get on social media for an afternoon. You'll see the de-evolution of man at work. Um, but, okay, so if we flip that on its head the way the church fathers did, then Adam and Eve knew more than we know, particularly because they aren't fallen. So they had, a, they had a much more attuned understanding of what death is, of what wrong is, to disobey the voice of God. Isn't that in and of itself the only definition of wrong? To disobey he who is right? Yeah. So, so what is the knowledge there? That's the, that's the knowledge in the, in the euphemistic way that the scriptures speak, for example. Um, and he knew his wife. That is to uh, become and do. And so we became and do, we became and did, we become and do evil. And that's what it means in the fullest sense to know uh, good and evil. Right? Is, that, is that contrast, I mean, because here's the thought question. Is that contrast in any way necessary? The experience and doing of evil and the experience and doing of good. Is that contrast in any way necessary? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, if it were, then God, what, then the Satan was right that God was withholding something good from us. You see, and that can't be the case. But what I was leading to was it, our heart was changed, you know, um, at that moment at the fall, where now we can encapsulate both that good and that evil right. in our heart. Yeah, and. I, you're right. I don't, you know, they probably, they were better than us because they were perfect for a, that period of time, whatever that time was. Um, or good, good, I guess. Right. Greater good. Yeah. Um, but, but we profoundly after that, I mean, so many paradigms shifted for us at that, that we, we'll work by the sweat of our brow and, you know, all of, you know, these new things that weren't experiences we had. I imagine, how could I really know, um, before that period, you know, because he said, now you will, and this will ha happen, and I will send my, my son to crush Satan's head, you know. Um, right. There was a, a, just a real, a real shift, and something shifted in our hearts, too. Oh, yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, all, I think at least since Pascal, um, the great Christian apologist, there's been this argument, and it's a very good argument, that the longing within us, you know, wherever it is that your life is hurting, okay, wherever that may be, whatever relationship or health or mental or you know, whatever it is, wherever you're, that longing for something better, why is that there? Why is that there? 
what on the on earth why would we ever expect perfection the fact that it's there is quite telling and to kind of then shoehorn pascal's point into this conversation um, we can detect those parts in our lives that are most painful because they aren't what they should be. Well, where on earth does should be come from? Because we have an innate and intuitive sense of what was supposed to be and is not. And that's precisely where the pain comes from. So that, that fits this idea, right? So then, then how is God working these evils? Well, precisely according to his good purposes. And I think that's maybe, maybe like resonant with your thought is that um, even in this fallen state God's still going to have his good and gracious will good and gracious way there's a book that I read called Sacred Stress and it's written by a guy who's a survivor of 9-11 mm. um, and he's a great Christian I've gotten to know him a little bit just in different conferences I've gone to and stuff and it's a book called Sacred Stress and that's where he talks he shifts it back yeah. to our God yeah, I don't want to get wildly philosophical here, but when people talk about the problem of good and evil, it's like, okay, define your terms. <laughs> because, because so much of what, if you just asked me, hey, do you want to experience this? I'd say, no, that's bad. Okay, but is it? Is it? I, it's analogous to the surgeon's knife. Like, do you want to get cut with a knife today? No, that's bad. What if that cutting of the knife is the only way to heal you of cancer and you're going to live a longer, happier life. Okay, yes. I mean, the same thing is like, do you want this bad thing to happen to you in your life, or did you want it? No. Um, that's bad. But in the long range of things, in the great scope of things, and then by the time it's all said and done in the new heavens and the new earth, what will you say? I also, just back to a previous thing we were talking about, something that I had come across that a woman who was paralyzed and couldn't get out of bed and all that, Mm -hmm. And what a profound job it was. Yeah. I have people who are sick and are gaining rounds on their deathbed that are really close to me, like a great aunt. My husband was talking about one of my aunties that, um, that was in this position. But I did ask that question to my mother-in-law. What is the purpose of my life when we can pray? Yep, pray. absolutely. And I mean, to spend all that time in prayer, mm -hmm. where you have, you know, you're given it, to look at it as a gift when you have no other focus, but I can Pray for anything I hear or what's going on in the world or, you know, it's bigger than me and it's small as me. Yeah. Um, that job is never lost. Very well said. Very well said. It's primary to who we are. Well, I see that we're over time. So out of respect um, for those that need to depart, let's close up. And then um, if anyone wants to continue the conversation, we can continue the conversation. The Lord be with you.